My name is Rosalind Teku and I'm the program assistant with the Africa program. On behalf of Ambassador Wolpe, the director of the Africa program, welcome to the Wilson Center. Ambassador Wolpe unfortunately couldn't be uh, present with us today. So welcome to this event on ECOWAX, the title is the role of ECOWAX in achieving the economic integration of West Africa. So for those of you unfamiliar with the Wilson Center, it was established by an act of Congress in 1968 and is the nation's official living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. As uh, both, both a distinguished scholar, the only American president with a PhD, and a national leader, uh, Woodrow Wilson felt, strong, felt uh, strongly that the policymaker and the scholar were engaged in the common enterprise. So aiming to bridge the gap between the world of ideas and the world of policy, the Wilson Center is a nonpartisan institute for advanced study and a neutral forum for open, serious, and informed dialogue. So now let me introduce our moderator, Mr. Chris Formunian. So Dr. Formunian is currently the, the, the Senior Associate for Africa and Regional Director for Central and West Africa at National Democratic Institute. Uh, he has organized and advised international election observation missions to Benin, Cameroon, Central Africa Republic, Cote d'Ivoire, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, Ghana, Madagascar, Mali, and Nigeria. He has also designed and supervised um, country-specific democratic support programs with civic organizations, political parties, and legislatives body in Benin and several other African countries. Dr. Fominian is also an adjunct professor of African politics and government at Georgetown University and adjunct faculty at the African Center for Strategic Studies. So now I'm going to let Dr. Fominian introduce our speaker, Dr. Shambas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rosalind, for those very kind words. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to moderate this uh, morning's discussions. And again, on behalf of uh, Congressman Howard Wolpe, who couldn't be with us this morning, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, today's discussions on the role of ECOWAS in achieving economic integration in West Africa. Uh, it's a true honor to welcome our distinguished guest here uh, this morning. Uh, as you all know, Dr. Chambers is himself a scholar, um, a graduate of the very distinguished University of Legon in Ghana, where he got his bachelor's degree. Uh, but he also has um, a, a law degree from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, a master's and a PhD from Cornell University, and has spent a lot of time himself uh, thinking through some of these issues from a, a philosophical and, and academic standpoint. Uh, he's also a former member of parliament, um, and so is very familiar with citizen uh, interest and uh, matters of representation and legislative oversight. On top of that, uh, Dr. Chambers is an educationist, uh, was early on in his career uh, with the executive branch of government in Ghana, and served as a deputy minister of education, um, but he's also a diplomat and a statesman, uh, and I would say that he's, you know, in the younger generation of African leaders that we all look up to. Uh, many of you will remember that he was Deputy Foreign Minister uh, for Ghana before joining ECOWAS, and that uh, after uh, five years working as the Executive Secretary of ECOWAS, he was able to begin to transform this regional body, and today is uh, serving as the President of the ECOWAS Commission. Uh, so there is no better spokesperson for the sub-region of West Africa uh, than Dr. Ibn Chambers here present, and I please ask that you join me in welcoming our distinguished uh, speaker to the podium. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, let me say how very pleased I am to have been given this uh, platform to address you, and um, more importantly, I hope um, uh, following the remarks that I will make, uh, for us to exchange some views that I can also uh, go back to 
Abuja uh, learning uh, one or two things uh, uh, from you because I know as uh, uh, an audience uh, which has an interest in Africa some of the issues that I will talk about are things that uh, you have uh, reflected upon, you have some perspectives which uh, will be very beneficial uh, to us in our uh, work back um, in the region. Um, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Chris, with whom uh, we've had the pleasure of working with uh, in several uh, of the uh, elections uh, that have been conducted in, in West Africa. Uh, the NDEI is a very important uh, partner uh, and has been uh, very regular, actually, in uh, its presence um, in all the major elections in the region. I was actually surprised when I was told that uh, Chris was, <laughs> was in Washington, uh, given the um, uh, current uh, ongoing elections in Togo because um, I know uh, during the last uh, Togolese election, the NDI uh, tried to work with us. Time was very short, and uh, we have, of course, in the, in the intervening period, been working together to improve the uh, uh, situation, the environment in Togo, to ensure credible and transparent elections. So, um, but I'm happy that he's here, that I'm able to uh, meet an old friend for many years. Um, I noticed that my speech has been distributed, so I'm not going to subject you to, um, you know, a process of uh, having to listen to me read through it again. I will assume that um, uh, it will be it will be read at your own leisure. So. Perhaps uh, given that um, we're running a little behind time, and I, I, I think you, you actually I, 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 you deserve an apology. Uh, our previous uh, uh, meeting before this got very animated, and it was difficult for us to uh, stop the discussion. Uh, and you know, but um, I apologize that uh, they've eaten into our time here. Um, so I think what I will do is to present uh, a broad perspective about um, where we have come from in, in the region, where we are now, and you know, where we want to be heading in the years ahead. Uh, and in the process, hopefully, I would have raised uh, uh, some issues which maybe we can uh, follow up on in a discussion uh, session. Um, the brief history of uh, ECOWAS is presented there. It was uh, founded in 1975 uh, when the leaders in the region, uh, in the post-independent period, thought that it would be useful to create uh, an organization which could facilitate intra-regional trade and commerce, allow for free movement of people in the region uh, to deepen economic cooperation um, which uh, would help to step up the process of development in the region. And I, I think 32 years back, you know, when you look at uh, that ambition, that, that goal, that objective, I think it was, uh, they showed a lot of vision, really, uh, because today with globalization, we almost take it for granted that, you know, countries have to work together. Um, but. Uh, even then, as far back as 30 years ago, um, at least some of the leaders in the region realized that uh, coming uh, to independent at small um, nations, some of them with you know, very small populations, um, at that time there were a number of countries that didn't even have a population of a million. Um, and even today, I mean, you have several countries in the region, uh, populations of 5 million, 6 million. Uh, which will be a, a population of uh, some cities here in the United States. So already uh, the need to create kind of market integration um, and uh, opportunity for economics, economies of scale uh, and free movement in the region was already identified 
And that was the perspective uh, informing uh, ECOWAS. Um, but just uh, uh, moving on quickly uh, to the 70s, we then realized that the organization became challenged with uh, spate of conflicts in the region. But the Founding Fathers had, had really not uh, focused on the nature of the conflicts that we started to see in the 90s. Because uh, they talked about uh, maybe trying to create a framework for resolving intra, uh, interstate, interstate conflict. Uh, states uh, uh, who maybe might have boundary disputes or some other kind of disputes that will cause friction between West African states. Um, so there was really no focus on uh, the kind of conflicts that we saw in the, in the uh, 90s, which were more intra uh, uh, interest rate uh, conflicts. Um, so uh, the, the region was caught unprepared uh, for many of these conflicts. Uh, first major one, of course, being the crisis in Liberia, uh, followed by the crisis in Sierra Leone, then it spread on to Guinea-Bissau, Guinea-Conakry to some extent, and uh, even uh, Côte d'Ivoire, Côte d'Ivoire, which for many years was uh, a very stable uh, model of uh, a growing economy with a lot of opportunity, um, a miniature West Africa, because you, you know it was open and welcome to citizens from just about any West African state who went there and found opportunity uh, to do business and, you know, really to, 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 to prosper. Um, but now, as you know, um, it also got uh, afflicted uh, by the conflict. So as a regional organization, we, we had to respond uh, to these crises because obviously they, they became now uh, a distraction from the original agenda of trying to build cooperation, you know, grow trade in the region, et cetera, et cetera. And the initial responses were, frankly, ad hoc, um, because there was no legal framework, you know, what do you do when a crisis has gone completely out of control and the state is uh, collapsed and has no capacity to protect its citizens and it's generating refugee fl flows across the region um, with impact uh, in member states who themselves are grappling just to provide a decent livelihood for their populations. Um, so you saw that um, with uh, the initial mediations in Liberia, even leading up to the deployment of the uh, ECOWAS uh, forces, the ECOMOC, was extremely ad hoc. Um, but I, I would argue that um, out of that, we learned some, some useful lessons, and it's out of these lessons that um, ECOWAS then uh, came up with a legal framework, if you, 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 you might, uh, the mechanism for uh, conflict prevention, uh, conflict resolution, peacekeeping, uh, defense and security, uh, which then uh, provides a framework, uh, a protocol that member states subscribe to, which guides us uh, what to do when we are confronted with uh, a crisis. And I think since the adoption of the mechanism, we have seen an improvement in our response to crisis. Uh, in the second Liberia phase, we uh, applied the protocol, the mechanism, uh, and then we saw that the region's response was, shall I say, more professional and in fact more effective and even more welcoming by the population uh, of uh, Liberia. Uh, we again uh, operated in a, in a more organized and, and, and focused way when the crisis also broke up in in Côte d'Ivoire uh, when we triggered the mechanism. 
Um, regarding the, conference, the, the, the crisis, I think um, on the whole, we have uh, shown a greater ability to or, or comparative advantage in moving in and helping to, res to resolve the crisis. Um, of course, even in the deployment of our forces, um, certainly compared to other regions in, in, in Africa. Um, but where we have been weak has been in the prevention, the prevention phase of a conflict cycle. We, we're extremely weak there. Um, of course, um, in the post-conflict phase also, the region has its limitations because in the post-conflict phase, you are looking at post-conflict uh, uh, reconstruction, you are looking at uh, institution rebuilding, because I mean, you virtually uh, are faced then with the collapsed state, with you know, institutions that have uh, failed and totally collapsed, and you need to literally rebuild there. Uh, a lot of resources are required, and uh, a region uh, which is characterized by many LDCs itself. Um, we, we really don't have a strong capacity there. And, and that's why, for instance, we welcome very much the establishment of the UN Peace Building Commission to, to help focus uh, and coordinate international support for countries in the post-conflict phase, because uh, certainly um, that would be beyond the capacity of, of ECOWAS. The kind of challenges that we face during these conflict uh, periods was uh, included, of course, uh, the wide proliferation of small arms and light weapons in our region. Um, the estimates of the number of light weapons small arms in West Africa is somewhere in the region of 10 million. And while we agree that uh, small arms do not themselves cause conflict, uh, what is also true is that their easy availability have often fueled the conflicts and kept them going uh, for many years. Um, and you know, in response to this uh, challenge, uh, we designed the ECOWAS small arms program uh, the initial program was one that we worked on with the UNDP, um, and it ran uh, its course for five years, and at the end of it, um, we wanted to have more ownership of it, so it was restructured and uh, renamed ECOWAS Small Arms Program. Um, a number of countries have uh, come on board with us, a number of partners, um, and provided you know, funding to this program. Uh, we still work very closely with the UNDP, and we have established national committees, national coordinating committees on small arms in each of our member states. I believe at this point it's only in Cote d'Ivoire that a uh, committee doesn't exist. But even in Cote d'Ivoire, we work with the National uh, Commission for Disarmament and Reintegration and we see it, in fact, becoming the nucleus of a national coordinating committee on small arms. Indeed, ECOWAS worked with this uh, Ivorian National Commission on Disarmament for the, uh, the, 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 the bonfire ceremony that we saw in Boaké, the uh, Flamme de la Paix, uh, which was held uh, in Boaké recently. Uh, so there's very good progress that has been made in setting up these national commissions because we believe that it's working through these national commissions. And the national commissions bring together um, government agencies, but importantly, uh, local communities and civil society organizations working in the area of uh, small arms and light weapons. The issue of respect for human rights and greater civil liberties uh, is also one that more and more we address in the region. Um, if you go back into the conflicts, you'll find that uh, uh, abuse of the rights of the citizens, uh, marginalization, uh, and you know, generally 
bad government uh, have been hugely responsible uh, for triggering, of, uh, triggering the crisis. And we're working as a region to build a network of national human rights commissions. Um, we have been in discussion with a number of partners, including some civil society organizations from the U.S., which want to work with us uh, to strengthen this network of national human rights commissions. But uh, one area that we have given great attention to has been in the area of ensuring credible, transparent, free and fair elections. Because again, uh, we've realized that uh, many of the crises had to do with uh, situations where elections were just uh, not known at all, um, therefore creating problems of legitimacy for government, or uh, elections were badly organized, you know, rigged, um, or just uh, poorly managed, and these often resulted in national crisis, and this led to the, the conflicts that we saw in the region. So as a region, we have tried to step up and to ensure that we play a role in you know, establishing uh, parameters and est establishing uh, clear guidelines and uh, really trying to raise the bar for acceptable elections in the region. Um, and in many of, uh, if indeed in all elections in the region, now we ensure that we have a role. Before the elections are held, uh, we, we ensure that we dispatch a mission to go and ensure the preparation, the adequate and proper preparation uh, for credible elections. And then during, of course, the course of the election, we field uh, observer missions to be sure that the security arrangements are, are in place to ensure that citizens can go about their civic duties, civic responsibility of voting unintimidated without harassment and that indeed they are ex able in an atmosphere uh, that is free of violence and intimidation to exercise their free choice. Um, this, I think, we have done with uh, good success. Uh, there are still challenges uh, in, in a number of countries. Uh, we have witnessed elections uh, that leave uh, much to be desired. But increasingly, the trend is that you know, one country after another in our region are conducting credible, peaceful, free and fair elections. And that's important because uh, we believe that it's a process and we need to encourage countries to perform better each time. Uh, those that are lagging behind, encourage them to learn from the experiences of countries that are doing better. Um, some of the recent elections that I'll just mention in passing, others we can discuss um, maybe later, are uh, the elections in Sierra Leone, uh, which we've just uh, come out of um, Chris, we were there uh, during that uh, particular uh, election. There were periods that um, the situation got very tense and we all got very concerned. Um, uh, and ECOWAS had to move in uh, with uh, a mediation effort to ensure that all stakeholders uh, remain calm and allow the process to run its course. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a very capable uh, woman as the chairperson of the National Electoral Commission, the Independent Electoral Commission in Sierra Leone who stayed the course and against uh, tremendous odds uh, was able to ensure that uh, the, the process was very well managed. Um, both for the first phase which was presidential and parliamentary elections and then the runoff you know, tensions began to mount again and ECOWAS once again ensured that it was there to calm everybody and to uh, keep drawing their attention to the bigger picture uh, because uh, at the end of the day, uh, what was at stake was more, than, more important than uh, the interests of any one party or 
any one individual for that matter. What was at stake was the peace and stability of Sierra Leone, the well-being of the people of Sierra Leone, and indeed of the region. And the Sierra Leoneans, in the first round of the elections, had uh, earned a, a worthy reputation for elections that were transparent, peaceful, uh, and, and free and fair. And we, we had to remind them to be, not to uh, lose, do anything that would tarnish that reputation, and we're pleased that the second round of the elections, similarly, were very well conducted, were peaceful, well managed, and that um, at the end of the day, all sides have accepted the, the results, uh, even when it meant an alternation of power, you know, which in our context um, is not something that you see too common, or you're never sure how uh, those who lose are going to accept that especially when they are in government and they have to hand over to an opposition. So I think in Sierra Leone, we have a very happy story coming out you know, of West Africa, and uh, we all need to feel very proud about the way that they have performed. Uh, more recently in Togo, uh, the country went to elections this past Sunday um, on the 14th of October. And I mean, those of you who, who know Togo, um, uh, what has just happened in Togo has been remarkable because this is a country which in the last you know, two decades, if not more, has been uh, one in which you had a you know, maximum leader, a classical African military leader uh, who was not successful in transiting into democratic uh, rule until his death. So when uh, Eyadema passed away in 2005, which the country was truly at a crossroads. And there were many uh, doomsday uh, prophets who just said, ah, this is another Cote d'Ivoire. You know, what we're going to see in Togo is exactly what happened in Cote d'Ivoire, where after Hufet, you know, the, the transition uh, just ran into difficulty, leading, of course, ultimately to the civil war that we saw there. Um, but I think we, we all uh, should commend ourselves because we, we moved in very quickly, ECOWAS working closely with our partners. And I've said that you know, where we've all gone and we've had a common objective and we speak with one voice and a, a common approach, uh, we have a very high chance of success. And that's what we did in Togo. Because in Togo, all of us were clear that there had to be reform in that country. Political reform, economic reform, and that the old habits of the past had to be given away. We, had, we all agreed that they needed a security sector reform. We had to rein in on the, on the military. Uh, we needed reform in uh, the electoral uh, sector electoral reform with a new electoral code and new voters register, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we've been fortunate to have a president who has understood the imperative for reform in, 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 Cote d'Ivoire, I mean, in Togo. Uh, the ECOWAS president, President Kampar himself, has been personally involved in uh, the process called the Inter-Togolese Dialogue. And it's true, this inter-Togolese dialogue, that they agreed the new electoral code and all the processes uh, leading up to the election. And um, uh, we are proud that um, Togolese have demonstrated their capacity uh, to conduct credible and transparent elections. Uh, to assure everybody about this, secure, their security, ECOWAS for the first time deployed military observers. We usually do not deploy military and police observers, but um, the Togolese asked for this. Uh, the opposition in particular wanted uh, an ECOWAS presence of military observers, and we did that to ensure that the, the, the Togolese military, gendarme, and police would stay out of the process and allow people to freely express their, their, their choice of leadership. Elections have become important because 
As you know now, the, on the continent, there is a policy of zero tolerance for military coup d'etat and unconstitutional accession to power. That means the stakes are now very high in elections, and we all should work together to strengthen the capacity of national commissions, electoral commissions, to be able to conduct credible elections. We should work to create level playing fields for all the participants in the process so that at the end of the day, all sides you know, should uh, be able to accept the outcome of elections that are credible, transparent, free, and fair. Um, at the last uh, summit of ECOWAS Heads of State, which was in Nigeria, um, I pointed out to the Heads of State that thanks to their ability to work together collectively, uh, we are now seeing that as a region, we're demonstrating greater capacity to solve our problems. Um, and we're speaking on the, the morning of the elections in Nigeria, uh, elections which uh, even the Nigerians will tell you uh, left much to be desired. Um, Nigeria has the capacity, uh, human and uh, material to conduct election, better elections than we saw um, in April this year. And I think um, it's fair to say many of the friends of Nigeria were extremely disappointed about the manner in which those elections were conducted. But the good news is that the, the government acknowledges that the elections did not meet international acceptance standards. And I think that's important because uh, the first step to curing an ailment is, you know, when the patient will admit that it's sick. Um, so I think that's, you know, a, a very healthy development that we see. But I think more importantly, and uh, the initial steps of this new government has demonstrated that it means what it says when it acknowledges that the elections did not meet internationally accepted standards and that it will take corrective measures. Uh, those uh, of you who were at the inauguration of uh, President Yaradua uh, would have been struck that after the protocols, his first words were, we're coming out of elections that did not meet internationally accepted standards. And I promise to put in place a high-powered commission to investigate what went wrong and to advise on corrective measures to take. Um, and has he lived up to that expectation? Yes, he has. That commission has been put in place. Uh, many of us were waiting to see what kind of membership would be on it. And I must say that uh, we're quite pleased when the commission was finally announced because it has very credible people on it. It's chaired by a chief justice, former chief justice, of the Federation, who is highly regarded, apolitical, um, and who, um, based on some rulings that he has given, even leading up to the election, shows that he's somebody who could be trusted to be uh, independent. Um, it includes the president of the Nigerian Bar Association, a human rights activist uh, of good standing, and indeed many others from civil society who have been in the human rights movement in Nigeria and who have been advocating for political and the electoral reform. So we are encouraged by the membership um, and we, we do hope that the commission will go uh, quickly to work and that it will in a short period uh, come up with its recommendations uh, which can then be implemented in time for uh, the next elections which are due in four years' time. Um, so I think on, on the whole, um, there's very good progress being made to address some of the issues that in the past have been the source of conflict in the region. On a general level, it also calls for good political and economic governance, transparency, accountability, fighting corruption, and ensuring that the resources of 
the region are well managed, properly managed for the benefit of the populations. Um, so having brought the conflict situation uh, under control, I think uh, the imperative now is to, uh, so to speak, return to the original agenda of ECOWAS, which was economic cooperation and regional trade uh, and development, integration. Um, I've often said that you know, the ECOWAS presents a, a platform, a regional platform, you know, which has four legs. You know, peace and security is one leg of this platform. And the other is uh, developing regional infrastructure uh, and building uh, regional uh, public goods, uh, good telecommunications, good road network, railway network in the region, which is practically non-existence. Um, how we can manage some regional common goods as our river basins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the other leg is, of course, policy harmonisation, uh, because if we want to facilitate trade in the region, then we need to work to create uh, a certain common framework of trade policy. Um, create a business environment that will allow uh, for easy incorporation of businesses, a legal framework in member states that makes it easy to incorporate and to do business, um, create a healthy business climate uh, uh, in our member states. And the regional uh, ECOWAS can facilitate that, and we're doing that by working to uh, create a strong and viable uh, association of uh, private sector, you know, and to allow the regional private sector to meet uh, regularly and to discuss problems that stand in the way of uh, doing business uh, in the region. Intra-regional trade in West Africa is very low. It's in the range of uh, 12 to 15 percent. Um, at the uh, recent uh, Africa Development Bank annual conference in Shanghai, I was participating in a forum with uh, a representative of the Asian Development Bank, and uh, he informed us that intra-ASEAN trade is 60 percent. You know, I had always had the impression that ASEAN is all about export to Europe and to North America. He says, no, trade within ASEAN accounts for 60 percent of their foreign trade, so it's very high. And I believe that um, in the region, if, if we can also you know, upscale you know, trade you know, within the region, that would be an opportunity, of course, to produce more, because to trade more, you have to produce more. And to produce more means you know, creating job opportunities for our teeming uh, youth uh, who are unemployed now and uh, are a source of pot potential uh, instability in the region. So uh, policy harmonization you know, is, is, is very important. We're working to establish a customs union, a West Africa-wide customs union. In fact, the takeoff date is 1st of January 2008. A lot of work has been done uh, to simplify customs procedures, come up with common forms to be used across the region, processing goods uh, you know, through customs, uh, improve training. Um, and uh, I believe that uh, all is set for a takeoff of the customs union uh, with an, a common external tariff uh, from uh, January next year. Um, but uh, free movement must go also with improving the infrastructure that I talked about because you can't increase trade if people can't ship goods from one country to another. People can put through telephone call to partners, uh, business partners in, in another country, or if the tariffs are too high, if you don't have, you know, dependable energy supplies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why we have programs in all of this. I don't want to bore you with the details of our sector programs, but um, 
You know, so conceptually, that's how we see the, f the four leg. The fifth leg is, also, is uh, good corporate governance in the institution because in, you need to have a credible organization with professionals who can come uh, and lead the process you know, and convince member states uh, that the concept of supranationality will bring an additionality to their national efforts. You know, so they give up a little bit of their sovereignty because that effort will bring some benefits to them. And it's being driven by professionals and people who have clear vision and you know, can manage the programs that they design. And, and that's what we've been doing also with the transformation and the restructuring that has, been, that has taken place at ECOWAS, you know, transforming it to an executive, from an executive secretary to a commission and asking for more powers, more mandate from the region to lead in the, de in the development of certain regional initiatives and projects. And once you get greater authority and greater mandate from the uh, member states, then you have to be accountable and responsible and more professional in the way you operate and, and you know, build more confidence um, in the regional approach. Um, the future, I believe, you know, looks bright for the region. In the last four years, for sure, the region has consistently had uh, above 4% growth. And that's for the first time in nearly 30 years. You know, so I think already we can begin to talk about seeing the dividends of peace. Uh, more needs to be done because, uh, unfortunately, our region is also one of the poorest. Um, and when you look at the UNDP Human Development Index, you'll see that uh, at the bottom of it, you find many West African countries. That's not where we want to be, but that's the reality. And um, I think that the trend that we have established is positive in the region. The regional approach can also provide a peer review mechanism um, for economic performance, because through our multilateral surveillance mechanisms, we convene meetings and we say, okay, how is country A doing as compared to country B in different sectors? And that, without being loud about it, is, is, it's a subtle name and shame process, and then it, it, those who are lagging behind, of course, try to uh, step up and try to improve on their performance. Um, so the, the, the continuing reforms in our member states you know, should be encouraged, will be encouraged. We will certainly continue to, from a regional perspective, drive it. Um, all our member states have adopted and accepted the Millennium Development Goals as targets to, to achieve, and that's very healthy. All our member states have uh, poverty reduction strategy papers that they are working on. Some, in fact, have already reached decision point and, as you know, have uh, gotten debt relief, significant debt relief. A number of our countries have also uh, signed on the Millennium Challenge account, uh, which is also very uh, positive. Um, at another forum, I pointed out that uh, we need to, to get that uh, uh, process going a little quicker than it has been so far. It's a little cumbersome and you know, it's been slow off the blocks and I think we need to really, because it's an opportunity to support the development of, of, of the countries, you know, set out criteria that uh, the criteria for uh, accession that are commendable and are in the right, uh, the right focus um, and when countries have then qualified I think they need to see the money uh, a little quicker and we could reduce the the, the, the bureaucratic procedures. Um, the focus also will be on trying to look for market access outside of West Africa. And this is where AGOA comes in. It's a brilliant initiative coming from the United States. Um, we're negotiating a free trade agreement with the EU. Um, 
There are constraints because I think we have to deal first with the capacity constraints. Um, the market access may be available, but the region may not be able effectively to take advantage of it. Uh, if you know, we're just going to be exporting traditional raw materials, as has been the case, obviously I don't see that that is the, uh, the strategy for you know, stepping up growth uh, in the region. We need to move into value-added production and see how funding can be provided to small and medium-scale enterprises um, uh, to be able to engage in value-added uh, processing for export. Establishment of laboratories to help in you know, improving standards and especially in dealing with the SPS you know, uh, problems that often prevent uh, real uh, access uh, in spite of uh, market access that may be offered uh, by trade arrangements. Um, so these are some of the issues that we are dealing with. There are some new challenges, migration. Migration is a huge challenge now. Many of our youth don't see their future in the region, and they are uh, doing everything, you know, including risking their lives to get to Europe and North America in rickety boats. And you know, if you're in the region or in Europe, you often read of uh, several West African youth picked up either in the Mediterranean or in the Atlantic trying to cross over to Europe. And you know, some of them, um, believe you or not, uh, think they can, with those boats, sail across to North America, uh, many of them perishing in the Atlantic. So um, it's a challenge that we're dealing with. It's clearly linked up with the development issue and in our discussions, especially with the EU. We've talked about migration and development until you can really create opportunities and let the youth see that they can stay home. Because, you know, it's, it's a difficult, difficult uh, it's truly really a global village we live in now. You know, even the remotest village, these kids can watch CNN and, you know, uh, uh, see uh, UEFA Cup matches and they're following the English league and the Italian league, the soccer league. And, you know, so uh, now in West Africa, you have probably more Chelsea fans and Arsenal fans and Barcelona fans than you have fans of local clubs. You know? So that's the, the world in which we live. So they want to go and watch Barcelona, in, in, not on TV, but in, in Barcelona. So uh, these are the challenges that... And then drug trafficking. I must say it's, uh, it's a menace now. Um, it appears that some of the organized groups Colombia and Venezuela and the Far East and Europe are seeing that West Africa is a soft spot and they're using it as a transit point to, you know, smuggle uh, drugs to Europe and I believe, you know, from Europe to North America. So uh, we have uh, undertaken to have a coordinated, a regional approach again in this. We're working very closely with the UN Office for Drug Control the regional office in Dakar. We have already convened one meeting uh, of experts, and we will, in fact, uh, go to the level of ministerial uh, level meetings on a common approach uh, to tackling the menace of uh, drug trafficking in West Africa. Uh, it's not a fight any single country can, can win on its own. We, we certainly need uh, to, to cooperate and pull our energies and our efforts together in combating this menace. Um, there is the Tuareg problem in uh, northern Mali and northern um, Niger, uh, which also uh, requires uh, a comprehensive approach. Uh, it's evident that we cannot leave Mali or Niger by themselves to find a solution to this problem. Um, the legitimate grievances of the Tuareg communities who are nomadic, marginalized communities in a very difficult terrain, you know, in the desert, in the Sahara, and, and who, whose culture 
uh, makes it difficult for them to be brought under a centralized control. Um, but there is also a criminal aspect which we should, uh, you know, identify in that uh, crisis. Uh, there are elements there who are uh, linked up with international smuggling rings, you know, human trafficking, you know, a lot of the youth trying to cross across the Sahara, you know, these are the people who operate these uh, rings, you know, up to Europe, uh, cigarette smuggling rings, uh, small arms and light weapons, and in fact, even drugs, you know. Um, I was being uh, briefed the other day that, uh, you know, because I was wondering, all this cocaine coming in, to, how do they get it? Is it on the flights the, or to Europe? And, and then I, I was told that, in fact, that corridor, that no man's land, is another way that the drugs are going, you know, through the Sahara in West Africa, to Egypt, the Middle East, and then to, to Europe. So. Um, there's that criminal element or dimension to the, to the challenge uh, which we are confronting. And we, we intend to work um, within an AU frame because we need to bring on board some other countries who are not ECOWAS member states in trying to find a solution to the Tuareg issue. Countries such as Algeria, Libya, Chad, um, even Sudan need to be brought on so that we can try to find a, a regional comprehensive uh, approach uh, to this uh, crisis. Um, the problem of uh, global warming um, is, is a new challenge that uh, all of us, uh, our awareness has been drawn to it. And um, this year, I mean, everybody in West Africa has been wondering what is happening. Even in Sahel regions, you've had floods. I mean, floods that have devastated agricultural lands and, you know, farms and uh, caused huge uh, losses uh, to, you know, uh, to member states, um, in, you know, just across the, the whole belt, and even in Ghana, in Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Niger, uh, Mali, all across the region. Um, it was an interesting case in uh, Mauritania. I was visiting Mauritania, and it hadn't rained. And the head of state called on the imams, so the whole nation, they should go to the mosque and they should pray for rains. And they went to pray, and uh, a month later, they were trying to figure out what to do with too much rain. There were floods, even in Mauritania. You know, so I think global warming uh, is something that we, you, you should, we should see. Uh, the whole issue of managing our environment and uh, common river basins, fragile ecosystems, particularly along the coast, the monsoons, uh, I mean the, the, the lagoons, and uh, they run across. If you take the lagoons from Lagos, they run across to Benin, to Togo. You know, so these are uh, common goods that we have that we should work on to, to, to protect um, and to ensure that we leave behind um, a world that uh, our children, our children's children, can also harness uh, resources that they could also use uh, to sustain uh, a decent standard of living. Um, I'll end it here uh, with these remarks. Uh, I've touched on a number of issues, um, some of it a little disjointed, but uh, I just thought I would throw out as many issues as possible and I'll be happy to hear your comment, your perspectives, and to answer some questions if you do have them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chambers. Uh, you've really raised a lot of issues, and you've hit on um, very many uh, sectors, all of which are very relevant. Uh, but this has been a very enlightening and very informative uh, presentation, and thank you very much for also also for making copies available uh, so that you all can take the time to go through this. Um, I should also remind our participants that uh, our deliberations are being recorded, um, so you could go back to the website of the Wilson, Woodrow Wilson Center and, and re, uh, share this with your colleagues, but also um, re-listen to this presentation. Um, Dr. Chambers is, is gracious enough to uh, open up the uh, discussions. He will take uh, a couple of questions. 
Um, I should say that so you don't run too late for your next appointment. We can give ourselves 15 minutes. Uh, we'll take the first three questions, give him an opportunity to respond, and then take another set of questions. And if you could please uh, introduce yourself uh, when you ask your question. We've got microphones on both sides. Sorry for being late. My name is Nchugansonu uh, Etu, a Togolese, but uh, living here in the United States, and uh, a consultant. I'm representing the Creative Associated International uh, that has a project in Liberia, mm. in education. And uh, we've been to Liberia, and uh, we met there where the president was uh, installed. Mm. And uh, now one of the concerns in Liberia is uh, after the U.S. Mm. we stop helping. Uh, is Liberia ready to go for the peace? Is the peace in Li Liberia uh, is sure because of uh, you know I'm just thinking of how uh, Charles Fellows has left the power with the promise that he's have uh, this golden asylum in uh, Nigeria and with all those situations things has changed and these are the creative concern about one one of the projects that has been started and we want to have this project continue and well done and finished for the Liberia people's sake. And this is for concerning Creative Associated. Mm -hmm. But one of my concerns about a Togolese or a mm -hmm. Equa citizen, mm -hmm. it's living, uh, coming from a French speaking country. Uh, I've been following so far Equas and congratulations. And I have to thank the Woodrow Wilson International Center to give us this opportunity to share this light on ECOWAS. And thank you also for being here amongst us. And my concern is about Wumua. Mm. I always felt like Wumua is like a counterpart of ECOWAS in economical way. Last time in Paris, we find out there is a kind of gossip, thinking of devaluation of CFA. And you know, maybe I accumulate, I'm sorry for that, but uh, we have shed some light on CFR and CDs and and Liberia dollars and all that. Mm -hmm. But the Yumua, uh, just I will read the question that I prepared to be mm -hmm. simple. Mm -hmm. In terms of strategy, goals and objective, what are relation between Equas and Yumua? Mm -hmm. And now, uh, if I may, just the last question, it's mm -hmm. just on strictly personal level, mm -hmm. Uh, are you aware that some of us think you could run for next president's election in Ghana? <laughs> have you ever thought of that? <laughs> Please, don't have to, you don't have to answer this question if you, like, if you feel like this is not the time and the place. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kojo. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Chambas. I'm Don Shirk. I'm the former American executive director to the African Development Bank. Is there any movement on the part of ECOWAS to get the African Development Bank to relocate back into sub-Saharan Africa mm -hmm. from its present location in North Africa? I think that the reasons the bank moved out of Cote d'Ivoire and went into Tunis were obvious to most, uh, most people, but I don't think it can best serve mm -hmm. Africa from its present location, and I think there are many people who would agree, agree with me on that. I'd like to hear your views. And, by the, and then, then finally, the fact that in the, cha in the charter of the African Bank, they call on the bank to promote regional economic integration. There are precious few examples of projects that have been financed by the African Development Bank that would indeed promote regional economic integration. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Uh, Tony, right here. Thanks, Mohammed. And um, <clears throat> I will just add a couple of um, questions pertaining to, to free trade. Uh, open skies. Um, I was um, discouraged to see Ethiopian Airlines uh, not establish a hub in, in Ghana, in part because um, there were too many requirements that were imposed upon that agreement from the Ghanaian government which I think were un made it uneconomic. And it, obviously, Accra is a much more natural hub uh, to West Africa than, um, than, the, than the alternative discussion. So open skies agreements. And then secondly, 
we've had this discussion. Uh, we will disagree on this discussion, but I have to raise it. Uh, the production of medicines in ECOWAS is virtually nil. Yet, uh, the, so the reasons for domestic per industrial protection are really not credible. Uh, yet, in countries such as Nigeria, uh, tariffs on vaccines can be as much as 40 percent on the product. Uh, this, to me, impedes the distribution uh, of uh, needed uh, medicines uh, and undermines the, uh, the need for a, a healthy workforce uh, within ECOWAS, which is needed. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. You want to respond to those three? Right. Um, yeah. On the um, production of medicine and the tariffs, I think under the CET, um, when the customs union comes into effect, um, the highest um, uh, rates will be 20%. Still too high, but okay. Yeah, but, you know, but that would be a 100% reduction. Um, so that is the trend. To, we acknowledge that we need to encourage uh, efficiency in the region, and um, um, but at the same time, you know, I think we need a, a little bit of a transition period uh, because the difficulty is that a quick liberalization will pose problems for employment in an environment where an unemployment is already high. So, you know, it's trying to strike the balance. I think it's, it's um, advisable to have a transition period for lowering of tariffs and liberalizing trade uh, totally. Uh, on the open skies, um, I must say that I feel frustrated because the Yamuk-Sukro agreement, which is uh, West and Central African states have uh, signed to it, calls for open skies. But then you still have the lingering national sovereignty. People want to fly with their national flags, even if it means you subsidize airlines. Why should you subsidize a few elites, you know, flying, um, you know, when the bulk of the population do not fly? You know, so these are concerns. But within the context, uh, and I'm here with my commissioner for infrastructure, this is one of the issues we keep pushing, you know, to, to liberalize the skies, to open up the skies, and allow, you know, competition, uh, which then will improve services and uh, also um, uh, lower the cost, because, I mean, um, my uh, brother here from Togo will tell you that if he's going to go to Togo and you see the price that he has to pay for a ticket, I mean, you could go to Australia uh, from Washington several times, at, you know, for that amount, you know. So the, the real issues there, and I, I, I mean, I, I, ECOWAS as an organization, we advocate for full implementation of the Yam Yamusukro uh, Accord in, in that regard on free skies. Um, the, yes, when the ADB will go back to Abidjan, that continues to be our position in ECOWAS and in Africa. That is a temporary relocation because of the crisis. We had hoped that the Ivorians would also appreciate the need to quickly you know, bring things back to normal so that organizations, institutions such as ADB can come back. Because um, uh, the longer the crisis drags out, the more it becomes difficult. At this point, um, uh, what is good is that there is no talk of moving it to another location. So I think uh, we're all just waiting for a situation in, in Cote d'Ivoire to return to normalcy, and then um, there's a clear understanding that the bank will not remain in Tunis. It will relocate. The new timelines that I'm hearing now, because at the next year, the, the board was supposed to meet on that. But elections now are not due till uh, at the earliest, I can see that it will be October, December, 08. And after that, you know, we'll have to wait 09 and see how it really frames up. So I'm, I'm beginning to hear 2010. You know, so, I mean, but... That's just the reality we may have to deal with, you know, in terms of its uh, present. But 
Um, what I also know is that uh, many of the staff are very dissatisfied with being in Tunis. Initially it was okay, but then they're not really happy working from Tunis, so I think that will work on that. On the regional approach, um, ADB, as the World Bank, until very recently, had not really thought seriously about the regional approach. So, in fact, they didn't even have departments on regional uh, integration. Uh, happily, they have corrected that. The last three years, AD, uh, the bank, World Bank, has established a department, regional integration, uh, and indeed, as part of the annual meetings, there's a special forum on Africa on regional integration. Um, the same with ADB. As you probably know now, there's a vice president for, Afri for integration, for regional integration. Um, the South African vice president has included in his portfolio uh, regional integration. So that's a positive step. We still need to look for instruments, financing instruments, for regional projects. And I think that's a major challenge that they're working on so that those cross-border projects we can identify and have instruments within the bank for funding uh, such projects. Um, on the uh, question about Liberia and uh, UEMOA, on UEMOA, uh, there have been improved working relations between ECOWAS and UEMOA. And in fact, for those of you who may not be familiar, eight of the uh, ECOWAS member states were former uh, French uh, uh, colonies have a union, and indeed they, or they, they currently have a common currency, um, the CEFA, um, and that brings them into a, a union, um, a monetary union in West Africa. Uh, we've worked to improve the synergy between our two organizations. In the negotiations of free trade agreement, um, I'm the chief negotiator, but I have as a partner, Smiler Sise, who is president of UEMWA. And we endeavor to speak with one voice on behalf of West Africa. Uh, in the development of infrastructure, such as, for instance, we're working on the Lagos-Abidjan corridor to try and see how we can improve you know, the infrastructure and free movement along that corridor. We work very closely with UEMWA. In the energy, you know, West Africa Power Pool Project um, and some of the uh, production side projects also. The scope is 15 members of West Africa, and we work very closely with UEMA. On the currency, um, there are all those concerns about SAFA being overvalued, the role of the Central Bank of France, and I think we are beginning to see some of the UMO countries pushing the debate in West Africa to say, why don't we look and talk about a common West Africa-wide currency? In fact, um, uh, two weeks ago in Ouagadougou, the central bank governors and ministers of finance met precisely on this issue. And yesterday in my discussions with the IMF, uh, I brought this up because the ministers called for a study by a consultant on scenarios, different approaches to arriving at the common West African currency. And the good news that came out of my meeting with the fund yesterday was that they have agreed to fund such a consultancy study. And in fact, on my way here, I was just finalizing a letter that I'm sending to uh, Mr. Biochani, you know, on, on that. You know, it was, so that will l let us look at, you know, very critically, the way forward in floating a West African currency. Um, of course, one that, for it to be credible, will have to be based on clear convergence criteria that would have identified in member states deepening their reform and uh, increasing, you know, the, the, the improving the management, fiscal and monetary policy management to ensure that whatever current is, currency that we come up is credible and is sustainable. You know, um, on, the, on Liberia, um, whether the peace is sustainable, um, there are a number of things that I should point out. One is that we need to see uh, more work 
the national reconciliation process. Because, I mean, uh, in a country that is coming out of civil war, um, it's a country, uh, Liberians themselves say, where everybody has stepped on everybody's toe. So if that's the case, then they have to learn how to, you know, not constantly refer to you step on my toe. Because if you say stop on this man's toe, he say, but you step on my auntie's toe. Everybody has stepped on everybody's toe. So how do we, you know, within the framework of rule of law and justice, but let's try and forget some of, because if we keep reminding ourselves of what we did to each other in Liberia, I don't think the country will, will, will have sustainable peace. But uh, aside that, there has to be stronger post-conflict reconstruction because you know, some activities have to start there that can generate and create jobs to employ the, 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 the youth, particularly the former you know, ex-combatants. You know, many of them you know, find them idle, then the devil will find something for them to do they're idle. So we must, you know, not allow that to happen. But in that context, I think we, the debt problem of Liberia needs to be addressed. Um, it's not so much the volume of the debt, it's the arrears, which is posing a problem now. Because of the arrears, Liberia cannot access cheaper monies from ADB, from World Bank, and other. So that problem needs really now to be Yesterday, I happened to be at the dinner, the Africa annual dinner, and I, I heard very uh, clearly and loudly the president of Liberia you know, saying, uh, it's not enough to be close to finding a solution <laughs> to our problem of the debt. So it's what we need, you know, because we've been too close to solution and nothing is moving. We need the solution now, and I agree with her. You know, so these are uh, some of the things that I think if we can address them, then there's a very, very good chance that that peace will be sustainable. But I'm very optimistic about Liberia because of the quality of leadership we have in there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we, we've run out of time, but I see you have a burning question. Uh, can, can you be very precise with your question? We'll take him, and then we'll, we'll take you as the last two questions. I'm sorry, we are... Very quick. Nicolas de Zamarossi, I'm a student, uh, and I was wondering if you could briefly characterize relations between the EU and ECOWAS, and do you see any lessons from the history of European integration for West Africa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nnamdi Diazera. I'm with the Commercial Law Development Program. Uh, I'd like to ask about... Um, uh, would ECOWAS seek a more formal economic framework agreement with the U.S., um, much as you have with the EU? And um, what about a regional framework for tackling intellectual property protection for West Africa? Thank you, Namdi. Mm. Um, formal relations, ECOWAS, U.S. Um, I had a meeting with uh, my sister, Florizel, yesterday. And I recognize here Ms. Abe, who was in the meeting. Um, that was uh, an issue we discussed in a global sense. Um, and I think we'll be coming back to that. Uh, for now, we would like you know, to work with the U.S. Trade uh, Representative's Office to strengthen ECOWAS capacity in trade negotiations. So when we come to that point of negotiating, we will have the capacity to withstand the formidable negotiating capacity of the, of the U.S. side. But um, uh, I think at this point, uh, the focus is probably on trying to identify some bilateral trade uh, partners, and then ECOWAS can come in through there. But that is an, you know, I mean, this is a market that we cannot ignore. I mean, and um, West Africa, in relation to Africa, I think West Africa is very well positioned to benefit, take advantage of the huge, you know, U.S. market. And, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, issues of uh, history, et cetera, et cetera, just make it uh, a natural thing we should be looking at. Um, on intellectual property, at the regional level, we're not very strong working, you know, on, on developing a regional position. Uh, on that we should, because I know there have been concerns, 
you know, regarding traditional medicine, et cetera, et cetera, you know, in relation to pharmaceutical industry. Um, and we have had some visits from WIPO in the past. I think um, as we, you know, rebuild the capacity at the Secretariat, we definitely should be bringing on board people who can look at that. Because that's an issue that I think from a regional point of view, we can bring a lot of added value uh, to member states and, and help them um, in defining or at least in having a clearer understanding of the very intricate, you know, technical issues involving intellectual property uh, protection, et cetera. Um, relations between ECOWAS and EU, if you had asked me that question before our meeting in uh, Abidjan, I would have said excellent, you know, and I mean, on a serious note, we have very r regular, ongoing dialogue with the EU. In fact, uh, we have a standing, uh, what we call a troika, political dialogue between ECOWAS and EU. Two times a year, we meet at the level of uh, president of the commission, uh, plus, you know, uh, three, four minister ministers on our side. I go with three, four ministers foreign affairs, and the EU comes with two ministers, current uh, presidency and future presidency, you know, for the Troika formula. And they've been very useful. You know, they've enabled us to discuss, you know, political relations, uh, economic trade uh, relations, the EPA negotiations, um, but also new challenges, such as migration. And in fact, as a result of uh, this process, we have now even a standing task force EU ECOWAS on migration, you know, and they meet on their own a technical level. They bring issues up to the Troika, and then we take them up uh, at the ministerial level and even at the head of state level. Um, so that's uh, very, very fruitful. When I leave here, I'm going to Lisbon for a meeting with the EU presidency, with Solano and, and others, uh, because they're bringing the regional economic communities to discuss the agenda of the EU Africa Summit, you know, which will be in December. Um, the economic partnership agreement talks have entered a very critical phase. And at this point, uh, we're pooling, you know, and uh, pooling in different directions. The EU is fixed on timeline. December 31st is coming, Kutonu expires. We cannot live in a legal vacuum. There will be trade disruptions, uh, which is all true. But on the other hand, on the West Africa side, there are still some outstanding issues to be, uh, to be, I mean, to be finalized, such as uh, accompanying measurements, you know, for uh, a, you know possible uh, loss of revenue, you know, physical impact on a few of our member states. Certainly, the non-LDCs such as Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Nigeria, Caved, especially Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, um, issues of uh, capacity building. We had agreed on establishing a regional fund to support capacity building, you know, and uh, improving competitiveness in West Africa. All of this have not been finalized. Um, even just defining uh, and calculating you know, the fiscal impact, you know, there's some very complicated, it's, it's not simple arithmetic, you know, uh, and we haven't agreed the formula and, you know, the really done the good assessment. Um, so we discuss these issues at the fund also and we'll continue with the bank um, uh, today, tomorrow and Sunday because these are genuine concerns that we have. And, uh, I mean, for instance, if I link this with the peace and security situation in the region, for a region just coming out of conflicts and beginning to feel that we're turning the corner, and I mentioned about the good economic growth, not, not good, 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 but at least, you know, it's on the upward trend. Do we want now something that could possibly disrupt, you know, a new trade regime? That, so there has to be more certainty on our side about what we're getting into or what the European side is offering. Um, and, and so this is, uh, you know, producing at this point a little bit of a friction, but because we have constant and regular dialogue, um, I think that when we meet um, uh, Peter Mandelson and uh, Louis Michel, we can, 
you know, try to have a good understanding of the way forward after December 31st, 2007. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just uh, use the prerogative of the chair to, or the moderator to uh, round this up uh, a little bit? Because I, I hear a lot of very positive things that are happening in the sub-region, and, and we're all so thankful for that, um, even in terms of economic growth, in terms of some of the multi-state initiatives on the economic front and creating an enabling environment. Uh, but I also hear uh, some of the lingering challenges uh, that, that you still face in the sub-region. Uh, and I think about people in Washington who are many steps removed from what's happening on the ground and who tend not to go into the details because their major source of information is the international media. And, and we know the coverage that Africa tends to get in general and that sometimes the, the success stories can get eclipsed by a few incidents of bad news here and there. So how do you, uh, to kind of project this enabling environment, how do you avoid, say, the Ghanas and the Benins that are doing well from the governance perspective being eclipsed, say, by a Guinea Conakry that's stuck in, in, in a transition or a Cote d'Ivoire that you know, has so much potential but can't really bring it to bear because of the lingering uh, polarization? or the good elections in, say, Liberia and Sierra Leone mm -hmm. being eclipsed by bad elections in Nigeria? I think um, one thing that we should uh, continue to do is work closely with our partners uh, for them to strengthen our capacity uh, as a regional organization to be able to intervene more effectively in uh, member states. Um, if you take the case of uh, Guinea, um, they were on the brink, I mean, in the early this year, January, February. Um, and ECOWAS, I think, was able to go in there and with the support of our partners, uh, avoided what could otherwise have been disastrous, not only for Guinea, but uh, could have threatened the peace in Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone, because if you compare the size of Guinea, in that region, I mean, any disruption there would have uh, very negative consequences for its neighbors uh, who are just uh, coming out of, of crisis. So um, we need to continue to work to build the capacity of the region to intervene in these situations. Um, we combine that with uh, rewarding uh, winners. You know, so I'm happy that uh, Ghana is able to get the Millennium Challenge account. Bene is able to get Millennium Challenge account. And in fact, when I go and I have meetings with the heads of state, I'm able to tell them. I said, well, you know, um, Benin got the Millennium Challenge account. Maybe it would be helpful to talk to them to find out how they did it. You know, I mean, if you talk to Benin, they'll tell you what the criteria, and if you're not fulfilling them, I mean, you, uh, you'll advise yourself that, look, I need to get my house in order too to be able to access um, these uh, opportunities. Countries that have not gotten debt relief in, in, the, in the region, we try to point out to them that those who have debt relief uh, have completed HIPAA programs, but it's, it also involves governance and consultation because you cannot do a poverty reduction strategy paper without you know, national consultation and, and discussions, uh, not just at national level. You have to go to the regional level and local levels and, and, and implement programs you know, in a decentralized way and improve governance. You see? And, uh, so I think um, these are some of the ways that um, we can, uh, these programs that reward winners will encourage those who are lagging behind. Um, the region is developing a capacity to influence internal processes. It should be st further strengthened. And, of course, uh, we've always uh, admitted also that um, there's comparative advantage, so we don't claim that we'll do all. So UN, bilaterals should continue uh, in, in, in working with member states and pushing them. Uh, that's one of the things that I say here uh, when I meet the bank and the, and the fund that in their ongoing dialogue, for instance, on the economic front, they should ask them, where is the regional perspective? Where, because everybody says regional 
uh, approach and regional programs and increasing trade. So when you're talking with the Minister of Finance and he gives you his country thing, and it's all just country focus, <laughs> in this dialogue you should say, but wait a minute, don't you think the regional uh, cross-border can bring some additionality, maybe help to notch your number up by, even if it's 0.2, you know, from that regional, and I think, you know, this is how partners can also help. When in their ongoing regular dialogue, they, 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 they encourage the regional approach. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chambers. This has been very enriching.